I've heard that there's a new nightclub opening up in Amsterdam called Tillertech, which is actually going to be housed in the former the school building, which I'm really upset that I didn't get a chance to go to. Um, the school was this incredible nightclub in Amsterdam that was in a former school, um, as the name would suggest, which offers up interesting acoustic opportunities. Um, I know this because I remember there was a period of time in London where everybody was involved in this sort of like property management sort of thing essentially what happened is that before 2019 before the pandemic maybe even 2017 2015 there was a period in time where people were basically renting these amazing spaces because there was a surplus of buildings available in london that were in the process of being knocked down or renovated and shit so these property developing management companies got together and basically were renting out these buildings for the period in time between it took from the building to start so you could be living in an office you know one floor of an office to yourself for like a year but then the obviously the issue was that you'd have to move around quite a lot because the building work once the building work started you have to kind of leave the site but you got a chance to live in these amazing weird spaces for a fraction of regular rent prices so i remember there's one particular place i went to they had a party there and these people lived in a primary school i think it was like in northwest london it was like in a primary school and it's like an old you know 80s built primary school loads of wood flooring everywhere loads of brick loads of big you know high what you call it high ceilings loads of natural light and honestly i honestly swear to god raving in that place when the person's house party and then just having a couple of speakers active monitors at the front i don't think i've heard a bad sound system in my life because imagine this sound was bouncing all around like a disco hall kind of like a like a assembly hall wooden floors think of like you know high school type of affair the sound was so incredible so I could only imagine what it was like raving in the school with a proper sound system and it's in the form of school. Anyway, um, luckily for us, myself included, um, you know, techno tourists included, the school isn't getting knocked down. They're not knocking it down and turning it into horrible, you know, glass and steel fucking skyscraper that has a shitty coffee shop at the bottom and loads of co-working spaces. No, they're going to keep the building, but the school's not running anymore. It's going to be another group of people who are also in charge of this bar in Amsterdam called Pamela, um, which is not to be confused with Paloma in Berlin, but there's this um, queer bar in Amsterdam them called Pamela that a lot of people kind of rate so the team behind this are the one that are opening uh that are going to take over from the school under the name of Tillatech. so they're going to be running it as well so there's an article here courtesy of a mixed mag that kind of delves into it and there's also a clip I want to play from the founders of um Pamela in Amsterdam who've taken over the school and now calling it Tillatech to kind of get an understanding of what they're going to be like and what their vibe is so the article that kind of you know um, gives indication what's going on it says a new nightclub is set to open within the former house of Amsterdam's the school Tillatech set to open its doors on April 12th it's said to be the joint project between Samuel King and DJ Lola Edu the founder of Queer Bar Pamela according to the translated article by Dutch publication Het Parol or Het Parol um, the project has provisional license lease date ending April April 2000. Oh man. Okay, cool. So April 2025 is when the lease ends. I wonder if that means when it's going to get knocked down. But anyway, for the time being, it's going to be open. Edo shared the news on Instagram writing so proud to finally be able to tell you that we're opening a new place always being uh, my wish to make the city a bit more interesting with my experience so you scroll down um, you also got resident advisor reports the project will be a multidisciplinary space hosting a restaurant workshops alongside club nights Tiller Tech will have a capacity of around 900 visitors which is a perfect amount of people with rentable spaces pop-ups exhibition spaces and more the venue formerly hosted Amsterdam's beloved 700 capacity club the school was shot for good in January 2024, which I missed that party, by the way, I was meant to go, but, you know, long story on that one. The school occupied a converted school since 2016, functioning as a nightclub, concert venue, restaurant, cafe, and exhibition. Despite the now defunct nightclub story, tenure at this site, Teletext marketing director, Passino, is it, what's that called? Passion Zienga. Okay, I love that name. Passion Zenga. Big up Passion the Zenga told Head Patrol that the new venue will also share the address with the school. The Zenga shared that the organizers um, plan to use the space in a different dynamic way. Um, and sometimes it's a restaurant or cafe and other times exhibition space and then a club. According to the Zenga, the Teletech hopes to provide a space for minorities, which is nice because I'm a minority, by the way. Hi, minority here. Especially queer people of color inciting the organizers themselves are part of these communities details have yet to be confirmed so that's great news 
then we also got news of the opening right courtesy of um their website so they actually they actually got dates here they're going to be open so they've obviously put a post here courtesy of the instagram on Tech. so the dates of the opening parties are going to be the uh, the 12th of april 13th and 14th um tickets available and look what happened once they dropped they dropped the tickets i think they gave like a secret link to people who signed up early and even when i looked at it it was already sold out but now look at it all of the dates are completely sold out so this is the power of i'm guessing um pamela and their collective of people within that co queer community in amsterdam and also probably the pool of the school and just a scene of rural because a lot of people have said to me over the years that i should definitely check out amsterdam i haven't been to amsterdam before i need to go um i tended to kind of not go to amsterdam or not be bothered because i'm not a big weed smoker so i thought you know if that's the only real thing to kind of go out there for i'm not really for it and the big festivals that they have out there they're a little bit too crazy for me to go to um you know the deck mantles of the world it's not really for me which is why i prefer to go to a, like a dre molin it's a little bit more eclectic a little bit more spaced out i feel like the mantles a bit more you know too packed so i never really you know made the effort to go but recently i've heard from a few people out there telling me that the amsterdam scene is actually better than the berlin scene people have actually said that with a straight face I had, there was a time where somebody actually told me that the school is actually they think the school is actually a better club than Bergheim, which is wild to think but somebody actually did say that with their chest somebody who i trust who i respect their opinion greatly so if they're saying that then i'm sure that this Tillatech place will definitely be just as good. It's in the same place. It's run by people who know what they're doing. Um, and already, as you can tell by the dates of these, you know, tickets that are meant to be dropping, they all sold out already. All fucking sold out. Friday, was it the Friday, the fucking Saturday and the Sunday, all fucking gone, which is absolutely incredible. Especially when you remember, if I'm not, if I'm not confused, that the lineup itself is actually, it's not one really that bait. I mean, I don't know. I don't recognize any of these names. Maybe I'm not really in the know. Um, we, apart from Roxy Moore, who I think might be from there. I'm not really too sure. But I don't really know, rec recognize all the names they're going to be playing. You've got someone called Afro, Afro Kali, someone called Cheyenne, Hud Cheyenne Hudson, Diora, um, Eat Rabat, Haiti, Jaru, Just In Case, Kyra Kad Khalid, Khalid, Lola Idu, um, Larry, Liza, retro immigration that's a fucking brilliant name isn't it retro immigration i love that one um someone called rosalie roxy moore soft break um tech lab vic sarah and zoe mcpherson so a lot of people i don't really even recognize so the fact that they were able to sell out all of those dates for the opening of this club with really unknown people is amazing fucking amazing 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 work so big up them for that but there is some good news because of the instagram actually they actually did say that there are going to be some tickets available. Um, they said tickets on the opening of Tekla are available now. Somebody also asked them in the comments here. It's a big up the person that asked the question. I appreciate you. Will you sell tickets on the door as well? The pre-sale link did not work for me. And, you know, I, I had some issues with it, but it, it just generally sold out. I think I, I got through one time where they were able to kind of hold the ticket, but when I tried to pay, it also didn't go through. I just, people people just bought them all. And obviously, Tech replied and said, a limited amount of tickets will be available on Wednesday at um, 1 p.m., uh, CST on Twitter.com, there'll be a limited amount of tickets on the door as well available. So as per usual in clubs, I think as an as a kind of FYI to a lot of people out there, in very rare occasions do club nights sell out and you can't get in. It doesn't really happen unless everybody with a ticket turns up and then everybody queues up really early, buys those tickets left over and then there's no one else there's no one else space left inside and it's one in one out. But if you just arrive early before opening, you should be okay. And, you know, and on, on the day, especially if it being a quote unquote international club, there'll be a bunch of people who bought tickets who will flake last minute. Everybody always does this. So keep an eye out on TicketWeb um, or t no, Ticket Swap or whatever, all those sites to get a, a ticket or maybe the fucking, what you call it, this actual site itself. Maybe the event ticks might have a resale fucking section that you could obviously buy tickets from. But it's very rare occasions I've seen in my life where I haven't been able to go to a rave. As long as you got the money, as long as you turn up early, you can go for the most part. Of course, there's obviously the aspect of picking and shit. So you have to obviously make sure that, you know, you click with the vibe and whatever it may be and be lucky to be selected to get in. But for the most part, if you're if, the, if there's a will, there's a way, in my personal opinion. Anyway, that being said, 
I did do a bit of research online to kind of gather to find out, you know, what these guys are about and what their kind of perspective would be in terms of opening the club. And there is a really good interview with the two people who did found um, Pamela's in um, Amsterdam. And they talk about, you know, their perspective when it comes to nightlife, their perspective when it comes to opening a queer club in Amsterdam. And I think a lot of what this guy says in particular, I think is going to resonate with how Teletech is going to be when it opens up and the vibe in there. So if you're kind of curious to see what the people behind um, Pamela's or behind Teletech are like um, this interview here should give you a brief idea behind it and they kind of explain and expound on the ideas around you know why they opened Pamela in the first place and um, Teletech when it does eventually open just play the clip here uh, yeah I think we would like to speak a little bit more about this uh, space that you've been able to create here and how people can really be allies here because when you have queer spaces it is designed for the queer community and a lot of people would like to be allies how is the importance for you for a queer space to exist in the city and what experience have you had that made you want to create a space i personally had a uh experience where which i do, do explain to people quite a lot to explain what this space means is i was in a, in another bar and uh it was a straight bar and I was actually there on a date because obviously I'm not going to date someone in my own bar, <laughs> so, unfortunately. So we were there and um, the date's going really well. He says that like it's obvious. He says that like it's obvious. I don't think it is. Uh, there's probably a lot of messy relationships and hookup culture within bars and clubs, I'd imagine. It's been a long time since I worked in a bar and the one I worked at you know, was just a fucking chain bar in terms of spoons and shit. But I'd imagine there is a lot of fucking hanky-panky with bartenders, especially in the club scene. It must be a thing. It must be a thing. It must be impossible to fucking resist. But it's probably weirder when you're the manager or you're the boss. You probably have to create some separation. That's, that's definitely a strange power imbalance, which people probably want to talk about, especially that's the thing that's really interesting. Within the, within the queer scene or even just the i'd like to deem it the kind of alternative from the mainstream dance music sort of nightlife scene there is a lot of like you know snobbery at the mainstream scene when they look down about how people act and behave in clubs but it's interesting that they have the same issues that the mainstream people have it's just it's just a consequence of nightlife i think you know as my parents always say nothing good really happens after 9 p.m so you know the worst of people comes out at night so it's just really hard to kind of you know, get away from those kind of messy situations. But I think if you're a manager or a boss, you probably have to be really strict not to fall in love with one of your barbacks. You know what I mean? Even though they might be in love with your life, you never know. But you have to be very cautious not to do it because if you do, and it doesn't work out. It's going to be awkward for everybody in the club. Oh, I lean in and I uh, kiss the guy. And then all of a sudden I hear, oi. And we both jump. And I turn around. I see the rest of the bars looking at us. It wasn't actually aimed at us, it was aimed at a bartender, but from that moment on, we felt no longer safe in that space. So we awkwardly just paid and left and went somewhere else. So then, then when I'm explaining it to people why we tried to keep the space queer is because these spaces are so limited, there aren't many of these spaces, that, for instance, if we didn't have a door policy and we allowed everyone that walked by, to, uh, walked by to come in here, all of a sudden, say for instance, somebody else from any part of our community was in the bar, and there was uh, it was predominantly dominated in here with straight people, then maybe they would get that same feeling that I had when I was in that bar. And that's a really good point that I'd never considered when it comes to queer spaces or queer parties, the need for it to be very much catered to their community because there's so little of them things available for them to go to but then the issue in, in in the uk especially in london we just don't have that culture of like door picking it's just not a thing it's recently become a thing i think if anything to be fair to them or to be fair to be very you know um to get my law and my history right i honestly do think fold were the main reason why door picking came back in because the main kind of selling point or the main propaganda or like promotion or marketing behind Forward it first opened was the idea it was going to be 24 hour club, which it obviously wasn't because, you know, 24 hour licenses in London are kind of hard to come by and they have them periodically spread out throughout the year, but they still one of the only clubs to open until six. And the other thing about Fold when it first opened was that they build it as like a 
you know, as 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 all the founders have taken all the lessons from all their experience around club land, they've learned about the clubs in fucking, you know, in Tbilisi, they've learned about the clubs in Berlin, they've learned about the Amsterdam scene, and they're going to put all that stuff back and kind of synthesize it all in this one space. And they're going to, you know, have door picking. It's going to be, I mean, that's that's how it kind of was reintroduced into the scene. So I think Fold was the one that kind of brought that back in. But it's still finding it difficult. Like people still complain about not being let in at unfold, about being turned away at certain other little parties they have there. Like it's it's still a contentious thing. We just don't accept it too well. Um, I think in the continent, in Europe mostly, people do people are comfortable with the idea of being turned not comfortable people don't really get as irate or as angry as they do in england if you get turned away at a club i think in london even if it is a queer place that's predominantly for queer people or lgbtq people or gay people it's people are just going to find it really difficult to take if they have money and they turn up and you turn them away but then I understand the need to protect that space because if you're building it you made it specifically from a need your own need where you felt uncomfortable being in straight spaces and there's not many of them for you, then you do it. But then again, you know, it gets into a murky discrimination type of field, which is odd because by their very nature, members clubs are quite discriminatory, right? Um, but then if you pay for a membership, you kind of get in. It's, I don't know, it's, it's a weird gray area. But I think in general, the strictness that some of these club nights have in terms of who they let in and what they promote and where they put their parties and who does security for them, I feel like as annoying as it can be for punters myself included i think the fact that they're so strict of it and the fact that they're so anal about it for lack of a better term has been the best thing for it in general that's why the scene is so good now because all these raves all these parties all these collectives they take themselves so seriously um they really try to think of their community first they put them you know as the first priority they think about the normies and the general public and the straights after you guys can fuck off we're servicing our community and whatever they say go type of thing and that's why they're all flourishing and doing great things in their own field but it can be hard to swallow when you're not part of the community you're like hold on i just want to party i want to have a good time and then like nah like, I, i'm not gonna let you in it's a bit mad it's like when i went to it's when i went to berlin recently and i was turned away from that's the only place i got turned away from was roses it's this bar in kreuzberg which is a really lovely bar it's all red and shit inside it's like really upholstered right it's really amazingly and it's just it's just one of the one of the places i like to go to sometimes to have a drink and hang out and shit but it's also a gay bar um but usually i always get in and this one time i guess i just didn't get in and it was annoying because you know i rocked up by myself to go in and they said no and then the whole group of other guys come behind me and they say yes it's like okay what why do you say yes to them and not to me do those guys look more gay than me is that why they get in and it's like and then it becomes a weird conversation in that respect because then you're going into it with a sense of entire entitlement and shit that you should get into everywhere you go in especially if you're not part of the community so it's a weird place to be but i i appreciate this explanation because it did make me kind of think about it in a different way like oh yeah that's true you know it is quite you know selfish to be like i want to get into everything when these guys can't have everything you know what i mean they have, to, they have to pick and choose where they can go but we can go anywhere so it's a weird thing but let's continue i love this in respect intro i love this explanation and for me then we've kind of lost the whole point of the bar because it was supposed to give you a space to feel completely that you didn't need to worry about like if you're with someone that you're going to hold their hand and is that safe for me to do here can i take are we sitting too close can i kiss this person here i just wouldn't want that the whole point of this actually very small bar it's this one small space in amsterdam that we could have for ourselves and uh I think that definitely, like, it doesn't exclude our allies coming in here. We I wonder if you could do that with, like, a black bar. Like, I eventually do want to open up my own club. Eventually, I will open my own club. But I wonder, if I decide to open up a, a space, like, that, that, you know, for cool black people in London and shit, which we don't have a lot of, right? We rarely, we have club nights and shit. We don't have, like, a one bar where you can go in and they're going to be playing sick music and shit. And, you know, you know, on the week, like, for instance, like, I've always thought to myself, like, why can't I go out to a place in London where I know I'm going to hear the latest hip-hop album that just dropped, right? It's not the only thing I listen to, but if I want to listen to this new fucking Future and Metro Boomin joint album again... I want to know that on that weekend, if I go to this bar, they're going to be playing that shit on loop. Do you know what I mean? They're going to be slapping that shit. And that, that should be quite cool, but we don't have one. Um, I wonder if you could do that. Obviously, you, it wouldn't be blacks only. That would be fucking wild. But it would be a heavily black influenced club or bar. Um, how that would go down. Will people have the same reaction to how people are, 
you know, getting turned away from queer bars or would it be understandable? Okay, cool. This Because I think pubs in general, traditional pubs are like that anyway, right? If the landlady or the people that own it, the landlords and stuff, are, you know, incredibly Caucasian, the vibe in it will be incredibly Caucasian. So it's not that big of a, it's not that different really. Um, but I don't know. It's not like they serve crackers in there and shit. Do you know what I mean? It's not that, it's not that, it's not that fucking um, crass. But I wonder if there'll be the same reaction. But yeah, I guess I'll have to learn when I fucking finally open it. Um, Zinger's coming very soon. Zinger's coming very soon. You definitely want that. But I think some people need to understand that there is a difference between being an ally and somebody who just on uh, during gay pride does a rainbow on their cheek mm. and then runs around getting drunk oh. with a load of gay guys because they're so much fun. <laughs> yeah. Same could be said for carnival, isn't it? There's, there's more to fucking being black than fucking dutty whining some big backy big batty girl at a fucking carnival isn't it right hey there's more to being black than drinking a magnum or fucking eating watermelon and fucking fried chicken you motherfuckers out there hey whoever's out there if you're eating fried chicken right now put it down if you're eating fried chicken right now put it down and yeah. people will say like no if you say yeah you are aware that we are queer but yeah i'm okay with it i'm okay with queers like yeah. it's a it's a way or being an ally and know about the community uh, and and also actually in the community, uh, then people just uh, yeah say are okay with queers, right? Yeah. Like, that's that's a bit of the difference okay, yeah. Yeah. because yeah, you know a queer or like uh, yeah, you you think it's fun. As a girl, they really like to be in a queer bar because there's no guy hating on you. Yeah, that's yeah. a different. Uh, I wonder who's the most toxic. I would love to ask a queer person. Or a gay person who who's more toxic the girls who are like the straight girls who are like overly oh my god you're so fabulous or this sort of ex extravagant excessive nonsense or the lads who like overly ask you questions also who's the top who's the bottom i wonder who's the most annoying to like a group of like people within that community who's more annoying the overly straight group of girls or the overly straight group of guys what's the most annoying group to kind of have to endure or to put up with if i had to guess i probably said the girls because girls are overly familiar right with gay guys and with lesbians they're going to be touching you way more they're going to be wearing more in your in your space they're going to be feeling your boobs to hair touching your makeup and shit asking you loads of invasive questions whereas i think the lads will be maybe annoying loitering around and asking questions too but they won't be as tansy probably they won't violate your personal space probably they might say some crash shit and say some stuff that might make you feel away but at least they won't personally violate you <laughs> you know what i mean whereas a girl would I mean, lift up your top, do this sort of nonsense. Like, what the fuck are you doing? Just going crazy straight, girl. So maybe I think the, you know, the Liverpool Street um, gaggle of geese women will definitely be the more annoying, I'd imagine. Uh, yeah, that's, a different, that's not an ally. An yeah. ally is you understand the queer community, you stand up for the queer community, you speak out. Like, it has to, it has to be, you have to be a bit activistic. Yeah, and I think another exact prime example of that is during Pride last year on uh, the Saturday, there was a girl uh, attacked by an uh, Uber driver. And a few days later on the Wednesday, there were uh, the Pride was on Saturday. On the Wednesday, there was a protest about this. Mm. Where were all of those people that were running around the city thinking it was all fun and getting drunk with us? Mm -hmm. That was the moment you needed to be there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because that was that is actually why we were doing this. This is that's the truth, though. You know what I mean? That is the actual truth. Where are you? Are you only there during Gay Pride when they're fucking handing out free fucking rainbow flags and shit, or are you actually protesting the you know the the assault or the unfortunate passing of somebody in the community, especially you know when it's a homophobic type of attack or something, whatever it may be. That's the real mark of an ally. Like, where are you? Are you actually 10 toes down? Or are you only here when it's party time and when it's time to have a line? Mm. Why Pride exists. It was, it began as a riot and it was to fight for rights and everything that we now have today and uh, still have to keep fighting for. Even on Pride, this poor girl got attacked in a cab. And yeah, I think that was really kind of a little bit when we were at the Homer Monument um, 
for the protest on the Wednesday, I was really looked around me like, where where are all the allies now? Mm -hmm. This is this is something that matters. Mm -hmm. This is not just a party. Yeah, and th that's why I think I think that if people are going to be that ally, mm -hmm. they either need to be with you on the moments that count, not just the moments that are just fun to be around. And they need to be contributing something to this uh, to this community. Yeah. <laughs> Agreed, 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 agreed. Very well eloquently put, to be honest. And to be fair, that little clip, I watched the whole interview anyway. It definitely opened up my eyes because, you know, I, I think I see myself as a pretty decent ally. But there's definitely parts um, of my approach, my understanding, my just presence that I still need to kind of be, you know, clued up on and fix up certain bits and pieces. So it was great to hear from them um, in terms of kind of opening up my side of things from the other side of things, not opening up my eyes from the other side in terms of how they go about it, their views and how I can best navigate those spaces. But in general, I think that video, that interview should give you a good understanding and a good primer as to what you could expect for Tillatech when it does eventually open. Those are the people behind it. That's how seriously they take their clubs. That's how seriously they take their bars that's how seriously they take their philosophy behind what they do and what they open so i'm really curious to see what happens when it opens and what it looks like so far no idea on the pictures and what it's going to end up looking like on the instagram i just checked their tag section here on the instagram page actually um there's no real indication on what we can see when it does eventually open interior wise there'll probably be no no photo policy anyway like most good places there'll be no photos available so so far we've got these two pictures um black floor i guess the, the floors have been painted white so maybe there's some studio spaces there because i don't think they're going to have a white floor for a club that won't, that won't make any sense so maybe these painting pictures are mostly to do with it being redone for the studio so no idea on the theme the colors and shit what we can expect um in terms of what it's going to look like on the inside how they're going to change it i wasn't really aware of what the school would look like on the inside anyway to be completely fair so it's all going to be new to me when it does eventually open up but i'm really eager to go um, flights to amsterdam aren't that expensive and the dates are pretty decent as well um april 12th um 13th and 14th going forward so i'm eager to see wild guan when it does eventually open eager to see wild guan when it does eventually open so big up to the tech lineup looks fucking sick can't wait to see it when it opens cannot wait to see it when it fucking does open